Hey everybody, this is Nick Morell with Audio Video Export. It's a pleasure, as always, to be able to uh, welcome all of you here. Uh, again, as always, it sucks that we're having this uh, crazy time uh, globally, but we're always going to make the best advantage of it as we absolutely can in order to be able to make sure that um, we're taking advantage of the downtime, making sure that not only us ourselves here as uh, employees of Audio Video Export, um, but we're also working with all of the factories um, in order to be able to make sure that you, our customers, have access to the top-notch information, and uh, you're going to be coming out of this situation in a better situation than how you were going in. A couple of housekeeping notes. There is a question box. Feel free to request uh, whatever question it is that you've got. Please place it in there. I'll be monitoring that, um, and if it's something that we think is going to benefit everybody, then we'll make sure that we, we an answer that question. There will be a Q&A period towards the end. Also, there is a handouts window where you'll be able to get not only the presentations, but uh, the step charts that Matt will be talking about later on in the presentation. You will get a follow-up email with a copy of the recording as well as those handouts. Um, if we miss whatever question, please make sure that you respond back to the email uh, or email me directly, nick at av-export.com or info at av-export.com or your salesperson. Uh, we've got on the line with us George and George as well as uh, our good friend, longtime friend of Audio Video Export, Matt Garfine. He is the owner of Audio America, as they are the rep company for Marantz and Denon and some of the other brands that it is that we carry. And we're really excited to have you, Matt, here with us and uh, sharing your time and sharing this knowledge. Thanks so much for being here and uh, it's all yours. All right, thanks a lot, Nick. And hello, everybody. Welcome to the Denon and Marantz webinar. Um, most of what I'm gonna go over today is not specific to get uh, any specific products. Um, really, I'm gonna go over the most relevant home theater technologies that you will find in our products and that are relevant for your, your retail sales, your projects and installations. Um, so to get started here, um, Sound United is the parent company of both Denon and Marantz, as well as the other brands you see on the screen. Today, Sound United is actually the largest uh, group of independent specialty audio brands in the home theater and high-end audio segment. We have uh, two leading electronics brands, obviously Denon and Marantz, two leading speaker brands, which is Definitive and Polk, Class A Audio, a high-end audio brand from uh, Canada, and Heost, which is a platform for wireless uh, multi-room audio, which we will discuss in detail here in a minute. So a lot of people ask, okay, Denon and Marantz come from the same company, why does Marantz cost more? Well, let's use an example here from the automotive industry. You, know, you probably already know Porsche and Audi belong to Volkswagen Group. And like a lot of these uh, auto manufacturers that have multiple brands, they share certain components and platforms uh, in order to amortize costs and deliver better value to customers. So in this case, if you compare the Porsche Macan and the Audi Q5, the Porsche Macan costs uh, you know, about $6,000 more at retail than the Audi, even though actually these cars share a lot in common. They share the same common chassis, they have the same motor, uh, but the reason the Porsche costs a little bit more, it's got a little bit, let's say, higher quality uh, terminations, you know, higher quality, let's say, in the interiors, maybe a little different tuning for the, the handling and, and the transmission and such. So it delivers, you know, slightly more premium experience, even though it's mostly the same car. Um, and in general, Porsche sells for about 15% higher price than an equivalent Audi. And why are people willing to pay it? Well, they're willing to pay a little more for the prestige and for that extra level of performance and comfort. And it's really the same with Denon and Marantz. They do share a lot, of, a lot of common components that are behind the panel that nobody can see. But the fact is they are two very different products. They sound different and they look different and they employ different design technologies and different topologies for their amplifiers. In fact, if we look at Sound United's engineering team that's based in Japan, there is one engineer responsible for the sound of Denon products this gentleman right here, Mr. Takahashi. Another engineer, Mr. Ogata, is responsible for the sound of Marantz products. Um, they both use different types of circuits in their amplifier sections. So the fact is, yeah, there are some shared components. Um, right now, about 57% of the parts between Denon and Marantz are shared. And a large part of that has to do with printed circuit boards, um, which are exactly the same in some, of the, in some of the Denon and Marantz products, as you can see here, these two receivers have the exact same board. And this is the most expensive component on the bill of materials for a receiver. It's the digital board. This is with the board that has all the HDMI processing, the digital analog conversion, the video processing. Um, it's the most expensive uh, component in any audio video receiver. 
the advantage that Sound United has with two receiver brands is that they can purchase these in higher volumes and, of course, negotiate better prices from their suppliers, which means they can then pass on a better value product to you and to your customers. So now I'm going to start going over some key features um, that are found in today's uh, audio video receivers from both brands, uh, Denon and Marantz, that are key, key features that are really what your customers are interested in and that might be useful to you as you design your projects and installations. And we'll start with what's the most fun of all. Everybody loves home theater and surround sound. That's been one of the driving elements of the home audio business during the last 25 years. The good news here is that Denon and Marantz and Sound United in general has always had the policy of being a, a format agnostic. We don't prefer Dolby or DTS or any other. We work with all of them. We incorporate all of the latest formats in our products so that the end user has the choice of using the format that he prefers. So I'm gonna go into detail about all four of these. Some of these you're probably familiar with and some of these you probably aren't. Uh, but the important thing to know is that we support all of these formats. A couple of them though are really only found on our more high-end products because RO, RO3D and IMAX are not quite so common and they're a little more expensive to implement. Let's start by talking about 3D audio. This is probably the biggest revolution in home audio sound in the last 20 years. Um, if we think about home theater up, up until recently, it's consisted of, of surround sound at, in, at the, in the horizontal plane at ear level. You've always had front speakers, you know, left, center, right. You've had surrounds, maybe surround backs. For the most part, those speakers have been placed at ear level. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's been, that's, that was great. That was a huge step forward from stereo in the early ProLogic systems. But now we have 3D audio, which means that engineers have, have, the way, have a way of mixing sounds uh, for, to, to exist in specific locations in space, because now uh, consumers can install audio systems that include height speakers. So a, a 3D audio system consists of the traditional five or seven channels at ear level, plus two or four height speakers, which we'll go into detail about here in a minute. And that adds the height layer uh, to, to, to the content. So um, to understand the thinking behind these types of mixes, a 3D audio mix consists of two components. On the one hand, you have the audio bed. So let's use the example here of a jungle, like you see in this picture. The audio bed would consist of background sounds, like the sound of uh, the wind in the leaves of the trees, Maybe there's a river nearby, you can hear the sound of the river. Those are sounds that exist sort of everywhere, not in any specific space. The sound engineer, the mixing engineer, has the ability to place specific sound objects now in specific locations in space on top of the audio bed. So the engineer can place the monkey here, specifically here, and the parrot here, and the other bird here, and the frog here. Um, it, it gives the engineer a higher level of, of specificity to place sounds in space, which makes the whole home theater audio experience much more realistic. In order to, to have uh, Dolby Atmos or DTS-X, which is the D DTS equivalent, you gotta have height speakers. And there's two ways to go about that. If the installation permits, in other words, if it's a, hang, if it's a hung ceiling with sheetrock, um, the best option is always to install in-ceiling speakers. Ideally, you use the same brand of in-ceiling speakers that you're using for the main speakers on the floor to guarantee consistent tonality. But we also know that it's not always possible to install ceiling speakers. What happens if the ceiling is, uh, is solid and you can't cut a hole in it? Or what happens if the ceiling is perhaps, uh, maybe it's angled or has uh, some sort of odd shape and it's not conducive to installing ceiling speakers? The option there is to install height modules. Many speaker brands, including Definitive, which is what you see here in the, in the picture is a Definitive BP9000 series speaker with their height module on top. Other brands offer similar solutions. The height module sits on top of your front and maybe even your rear speakers as its own speaker connection because it's connected to its own channel of the receiver. And it, 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 the, the sound dispersion goes diagonally toward the ceiling, not toward the front, but up diagonally toward the ceiling. So the idea is that the sound bounces off the ceiling and arrives at the listener's ear, uh, mimicking the sound of a ceiling speaker. And the effect is almost the same. It really works. So let's look at some examples according to Dolby of different configurations of Atmos systems. Now, traditionally, we talk about home theater, we talk about a 5.1 system, which means five channels at, at ear level plus 0.1 channel, which is the subwoofer, the LFE or low frequency effects channel consisting of information from 80 Hertz and below only. In an Atmos system, 
or in a DTSX system, we add a third number, which refers to how many height channels does the system have. In this case, there are the traditional five speakers at ear level, one subwoofer, and two height speakers. In this case, you can see the height speakers are coming from uh, height modules that are installed on top of the front speakers. That sound bounces off the ceiling and then arrives at the listener's ear. Here's a 7.1.2 system where they add, they're adding rear surrounds. So you've got this, the main surrounds, which in this case are lateral to the, to the listening area, and the rear surrounds, which go behind the listening area. There's a 9.1.2 configuration. This is a lot less common, which is adding front, uh, front uh, wide speakers, left and right. Not many people are willing to have so many speakers uh, cluttering up their listening area, so this configuration is not quite so common. Instead, you could have a nine channel system maintaining the traditional five speakers at ground level, at ear level, and adding four height speakers. In this case, you've also got height modules added on top of the rear speakers that are reflecting off the ceiling. So there's a nine channel system with four height speakers. Here's an 11 channel system with four height speakers. So I think you get the point. There are a lot of variables here and our, uh, all of the Dan and Marantz receivers allow you to configure the amplifier channels in any way that you wish, depending on the speaker installation that you're, that you're, that you're creating. Dolby recently launched an update to their Atmos technology, which is called Speaker Virtualizer. And this is a solution when there are no height speakers installed in the house, in, in, in the home theater system. Um, whenever you're listening to the, a soundtrack, whether it has hi, uh, height information or not, the Dolby Virtualizer will create virtual height information to give you the illusion that there are ceiling speakers installed in the system. This was enabled late last year via firmware update, and you just have to go into the uh, surround parameter menu, and it should be on by default, but if it's not, just go in there and turn it on. Now, DTS arrived a little bit late to the party. In this case, uh, Dolby launched Atmos about a year before DTS launched X, which is their version. It's extremely similar. Really, the main difference with DTSX is that they, rep they the DTS recommends installing speakers in a circle, uh, equidistant from the listening area. That's also not always uh, easy to do, depending on your customer and the layout of their home theater. They might prefer the front speakers to be installed in a line, which is much more common. If you're using the Odyssey automatic uh, calibration system that's built into our receivers, this is irrelevant. No matter where you put the speakers, Odyssey will adjust uh, will compensate for the speaker placement by adjusting the delay and the timing and the phase of each channel. So DTS, uh, here's an example of a 5.1.2 system with two ceiling speakers, a 5.1.4 system, 7.1.4 system. As you can see, very similar. The only difference being this whole idea of a circular installation, right? To me, that looks really good in theory, but I can't see many people installing speakers in their homes in this way. Uh, I also don't see people installing surface mount speakers hanging from the ceiling like that. It's, it's very ugly. Um, it's much more common to use either in ceiling speakers or at most modules that have the diagonal uh, vertical radiation. So like Dolby, DTS also offers formats uh, to compensate for uh, if you're not listening to a Dolby Atmos soundtrack or you don't have the, or if you're not listening to a DTS X soundtrack, pardon me, or you don't have the, the height speakers installed. NeuralX uh, is included with all of the DTS uh, surround formats these days. When you have height speakers, but you're listening to a soundtrack that does not have height information, in other words, if it's not a Dolby Atmos or DTS X soundtrack, um, it will create a height layer virtually and send that information to your height speakers. So if you're listening to an older movie with a 5.1 soundtrack, there will be information coming from the height speakers and it is, it is, it is virtually created by the circuit. If the system has no height channels detected, no height channels installed, then DTS has Virtual X, which works just like Dolby's virtualizer. It creates a virtual height layer uh, for any content, whether it's native or non-native. Now, Dolby and DTS are not friends. They are lifelong competitors and they don't get along very well. And uh, late, early last year, Dolby put their foot down and decided they were no longer gonna let anybody combine their format with any other formats. So now you can no longer listen to Adobe Digital Soundtrack in DTS mode, for example. If, there, if, you're, if the movie comes with Adobe Soundtrack, you're only gonna have a choice of listening with Dolby modes and the same with DTS. And you know what? It's no big deal. It doesn't really affect anything. If you ask me which one sounds better, you know what? They both sound great. It's really hard to say that Dolby or DTS is superior. They're both extremely similar and they both sound great. 
Auro 3D. Now, this is a surround format that's uh, quite popular in Europe, apparently. Um, not much in the Americas. Um, some of the higher end down on the Marantz products started offering Auro 3D as an optional paid upgrade several years ago. I think that in all of Latin America and the Caribbean, we've probably so probably maybe a dozen people have, have bought this upgrade. Nobody cares. Uh, I'm sure it's a nice format. I've never really heard a demo. Uh, so Auro 3D was invented in Belgium, and apparently it's a great solution for listening to music via five channels, and that was sort of the base that they started from. In terms of the layout, RO 3D recommends that the height speakers be installed directly above the ear level speakers. And they also offer an additional mode, which, off, which, which offers this one speaker, a ceiling speaker, to be installed in the dead center of the room. And you can see that additional point one here. And this speaker is what they call the voice of God. I love to lower the tone of my voice when I say that. It makes it sound more important. Uh, the Voice of God speaker apparently adds another element of surround. I've never heard a demo, so I really can't speak to how it sounds. I'm not going to say much more about Oro 3D. It's just not that relevant for us. But if you are interested in it, our products include it. And you can look on the Oro 3D website and get all the information that you need. Hey, Matt, we've got a good question that came in. Um, does the Given that the, the Denon and Marantz receivers will do Oro 3D, will do DTSX, will do Atmos, um, what's the general recommendation of how to be able to configure these speakers? Because I would assume also that it's the content, the Blu-ray player or whatever it is, that's going to determine which of these three formats it's going to, to you know, uh, change the receiver because the receiver can change on the fly, right? Yeah. The receiver usually will default to the, to the, to the, sound, to the surround sound format that's on the stream or on the disc. So if the disc comes with a, DT, a native DTS soundtrack, the receiver will automatically switch to, to that mode. I wouldn't worry too much about the slight differences in speaker configurations that you're seeing between Dolby and, and DTS, um, because as I mentioned before, uh, use the Odyssey uh, system uh, when you're installing when you're installing the home theater, and it will compensate for the locations of, of, of all of the speakers to create an optimized sound for every listening position. At the end of the day, I think we all know that the customer is always right. <laughs> and if the customer, you know, insists on installing the speakers in a certain play, in a certain way, in certain locations, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. But luckily, thanks to Odyssey, it's really not a big deal. It's not a problem. Thank you. So uh, let me move on here to IMAX Enhance. This is pretty new. This is included only in our latest generation of receivers. And this is a collaboration between IMAX and DTS. Everybody knows about IMAX. IMAX is installed in more than 1,200 uh, professional movie theaters and cinemas worldwide. They say over 450 million people have experienced IMAX uh, movies since uh, the early 70s. So it's already perceived as a premium theater experience. The idea here is that DTS and IMAX have teamed up to create a home, uh, home version of the IMAX format. And this is said to deliver a cinema-like audio. I have uh, have yet to hear a demo, unfortunately, so I can't really speak to how it actually sounds. But supposedly this, this experience is just more cinematic. Uh, now the good news is the receivers come uh, with IMAX mode uh, set to auto by default. You take that speak that receiver out of the box, it's already gonna have auto mode. That means when you play a soundtrack that has IMAX enhanced, the receiver will detect that flag in the soundtrack and automatically go into IMAX mode. You, you can also go into settings if you wanna turn it on permanently or turn it off permanently, you can do that. Okay, so moving on to uh, another great feature that Denon and Marantz offer that other receivers do not <clears throat> is that our receivers now include HEOS integrated at no extra cost. Um, <clears throat> as of the current generation of receivers, all of the networking models, which is pretty much all of them, um, HEOS was now it was added and, and they didn't even increase the price of the receivers. So great value for consumers. HEOS is a multi-room uh, audio distributed audio platform that works via Wi-Fi, everything is controlled via app. It's very similar to Sonos, to the Bose SoundLink. I'd say those are sort of the, the main three players right now when it comes to multi-room audio. Sonos obviously is the big one, it's much more well-known and, and AVE does a great job with, with selling Sonos in, in the region. Um, I would say that HEOS from the beginning has always been a little more focused on integration. It's a platform that's easier to integrate with, with home automation platforms. It's a little more open than Sonos is. Uh, but in terms of features and sound, they're extremely similar. Um, so having HEOS built into the receiver means that the home theater's zone in the house becomes a HEOS zone automatically. 
and you can listen to any single stream of music uh, via th through the HEO system uh, on that receiver, and you can play that stream of music in any or all of the zones of the receiver. So if you have a three zone receiver and you and you want to listen to whatever you're streaming on HEOS, you can listen to it in any of those three zones or all of those three zones at once. You can use the HEOS app to turn on and off the zones, to choose and control the content, and also to control the volume of the streaming in each of those zones. Um, you can also group the HEOS, uh, rec the receiver with HEOS with any other HEOS zones in the house. Um, there are a series of HEOS standalone powered speakers. Uh, there's a new series called Den on Home, the branded Den on Home, but they're basically portable powered HEOS speakers. Uh, there's also now stereo products from Den on Emirates that include HEOS. Any zones in the house that include HEOS can be grouped together. You can listen to the same music in all the zones, different music in each zone, however you want to do it. Uh, and the nice thing is that any any that any local source connected to any HEO zone can be shared across the entire system. So, for example, if your AVR is connected to a, a satellite TV and you're listening to a football game, you could actually share the audio from that football game with the other HEO zones in the house. Here's a list of the streaming services that are currently available on the HEOS platform as of today. It includes almost everything. Now, in some of the countries in the Caribbean, it's possible that some of these formats are not available yet. But on the other hand, we know that you and your customers are very clever and you'll always find a way to, to get the content that you want. Keep in mind that uh, if, you're, if you're using a streaming platform that's not yet native on HEOS, you can use the, the, the app on your phone and then send that, that audio via Bluetooth to any HEOS device in the house in order to listen to it. Just got a couple more slides on HEOS while we're on the subject in terms of retrofit solutions. So I think, believe that most of you on this call are probably integrators who are installing uh, multi-zone audio systems in your customers' homes. We have a couple really nice solutions for that. Um, the HEOS link is a great answer for customers who already have a stereo system or a home theater system. They're not interested in changing the amp or the receiver, but they would like to add HEOS as a new source to an existing zone. The HEOS link gives you outputs in both line, at both line level and speaker level, and sorry, line level uh, for uh, analog and digital, which you can then uh, it, it connect to any existing um, stereo or home theater system, and then HEOS becomes another source, just like a CD player or anything, or a tuner or anything like that. We also have the HEOS amp, which is a similar, same concept, but with a built-in Class D amp, 100 watts times two. It's pretty beefy. We've, we've run tower speakers off HEOS amps, and they work remarkably well. So the HEOS amp is a great solution. If your customer has a pair of speakers he really loves, he's ready to upgrade his amplifier, and he wants that, that zone to be part of his HEOS uh, system. HEOS amp is a great solution for that. Now, what happens though if you're installing, let's say, uh, stereo pairs of ceiling speakers in four different zones of the house? Instead of having to install four HEOS amps in the rack, which looks kind of kind of weird, you can install the HEOS drive. This is a really interesting solution that none of our competitors offer. Neither Sonos or Bose has a custom install friendly multi-amp uh, product like the HEOS drive. Think of it as four HEOS amps in one chassis. There's eight channels of 60 watts. It's completely flexible, bridgeable. You can use it in stereo or mono. You can configure this thing any way you want. You install it in the rack right next to the router and all the other uh, backbone AV products in, in your system. This is the only HEOS product that does not have Wi-Fi because it's designed to be placed in the rack and connected IE right there directly to the router or to the switch. So those are some HEOS hardware products that, that you should keep in mind for your projects. So now I'm going to move on to Odyssey. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, Dan and the Morants were early adopters of Odyssey. We've been including these pro Odyssey in our products for probably 10 years now. Odyssey is a system that was developed by Tom Holman, who was one of the founders of THX. And Odyssey was created to do basically what THX did in professional cinemas. Odyssey does for the house, which is create a standard for sonic excellence, no matter uh, what the situation of the of the of the, the room is. So Odyssey fundamentally consists of three technologies. The basic one, it all starts with Multi-Q, which is the system that automatically uh, detects speaker distances, size, levels, crossovers, phase, et cetera, and does an automatic equalization, optimization of each speaker so that it sounds uh, the best it can for all the listeners. And once you've done the Multi-Q uh, calibration in any system, you can then access other functions such as dynamic volume. Uh, Odyssey dynamic volume is a type of compression and this uh, is a great solution for that situation where 
We've all experienced it when we're watching TV at night and the kids are sleeping and we've, we've got to keep the volume down. And every time the, the, the commercials come on the TV, the volume jumps. And every time the program comes back, the volume drops. And you spend the whole night with your button on the volume control to react quickly to these jumps in volume. Well, with, with dy dynamic volume, you don't have to worry about that. It's basically, it's a, it's a compression circuit that, that, that makes, uh, makes the, the volume levels level between all the content. There's also dynamic EQ. And this compensates for the psychoacoustic effect uh, that happens when we listen at lower volumes, we don't perceive as much bass. So dynamic EQ subtly uh, increases the level of bass when you're listening at low volumes and also clarifies the dialogue coming out of the center channel so that when you're listening late at night at low volumes, uh, you have uh, a lot of clarity for the dialogue and you have, still have a flat perceived frequency response. A couple of our higher end receivers also include the, the highest, highest version of Odyssey. Um, which is XT32, and that includes two additional uh, features. Sub-EQ HT allows you to calibrate two subwoofers in your room independently, so you can get smoother at base. Uh, and their LFC, low frequency containment, is a circuit that uh, reduces the amount of, of base that will travel through walls and allows you to perceive more base in the room. So why is this all necessary? Well, again, let's go back to the example of a professional cinema. When a sound engineer is mixing a soundtrack for a movie, he knows that, that, that cinemas around the world basically follow similar standards in terms of the room size, uh, the mix of absorptive and reflective materials, the type of speakers that are installed, their location, the type of radiation that they have, uh, you know, the acoustically uh, transparent screen with the center channel behind it. Most cinemas follow very strict standards, so it's easy for them to create soundtracks that will sound great. But those engineers have no idea what your what your home theater room sounds like or your customer's room sounds like. They have no way to know. So Odyssey is a way of, of making sure that the sound in each home theater is great, no matter what the configuration of the room is. So here's an example to illustrate that with these very crude drawings that must have been created by a three-year-old at some point, but I haven't been able to find anything better. Uh, here we have an example of a speaker. Yes, that's supposed to be a speaker, even though it's just a hole. Don't ask me why. And here you have three listening groups that are perceiving different sound. Maybe this, maybe this room is open over here and maybe there's a hard uh, a glass reflecting window here, for example. So the acoustic environments are totally different. So you look at the frequency response curves that each of these three listening groups are perceiving, they're totally different, even though it's all coming from the same point source, the same speaker. So what MultiQ does is it measures from each listening position, it measures the sound coming out of every speaker and performs a series of calculations and comes up with an equalized sound. So here you can see the original curves of four seating positions in blue, and you can see the equalized curves in red. As you can see, the red curves are, are a lot more consistent and closer to flat than the original curves were. So how does this all work? When you open the box of a Denon or Marantz receiver, you will see a microphone. Uh, here's the microphone. We do not recommend you sit on this microphone. We do recommend that you use the included stand. This is made out of uh, cardboard and it's foldable. Use this stand to place the microphone at ear height on top of the seating position. You don't want to measure the sound. Uh, you don't want to do the calibration measuring from the cushion. Nobody listens to a movie with their head on the cushion. You want to measure at height level. So instead of using a tripod like you see here, use our built-in stand, which is adjustable, and put the mic at height level. Now, before you start this calibration process, um, first go in and assign all of your surrounding height channels in the receiver. Set your subwoofer with volume about approximately in the middle. Bypass all the crossovers if you can. Have it connected to its LFE input, set the phase at zero, and remove background noise. If there's kids in the house, if there are pets in the house, please make sure they're not in the room. If you have a noisy uh, video projector or electronics, please try to turn those off. It's important that the microphone is only hearing the sound coming out of the speakers. As soon as you plug that microphone into the front panel of the receiver, you will start to hear test tones coming out of each speaker, starting with the left front and rotating around the room. And it's basically a, a white noise uh, tone, and this, this, the, it lasts about 30 seconds per, per channel. And the microphone is, is using that to detect the speaker's phase, its frequency response, its location, etc. So the Odyssey microphone is applying a digital circuit uh, to that curve and creating an approximation of the curve in, in the digital domain. So it's very close. And then what happens is the circuit applies an inverse curve to each, uh, each channel to come up with a, the corrected sound. 
But it's actually much more complex than that. And I can't even explain the full complexity of it because it does this same process for every single speaker uh, based on measurements from every single listening uh, position. So it's pretty, pretty complex stuff. It actually works. It works great. The process takes 20 minutes or maybe half an hour. Please don't be lazy. Please use Odyssey. It's a great feature. It's a value add for your customers. It makes the system sound better and makes you look like an expert going around the room with a microphone and measuring your customers' speakers. Now, if you really want to get serious about this, if you really want to be a pro, uh, you can drop $20 on the iTunes Store or Google Play Store and buy the Odyssey Multi-Q Editor app, which offers a whole other level of flexibility and configuration for this process. Now, there are three different versions of Odyssey, uh, and they're included in our products based on price points. So our entry-level products for both Denon and Marantz have the basic version of Odyssey, which is bronze, which has multi-Q, dynamic volume, dynamic EQ, and allows you to measure up to six positions. The step-up version is called Silver, multi-Q XT. Okay, you can see that's included in our mid-range products, and it allows you to measure up to eight positions. And then finally, the high-end version is called, uh, is called XT32. That's the one that includes the sub EQ, HT, and the LFC feature. And that's included in our high-end models on both brands. So that's Odyssey. And I'm going to pause to take a quick drink. While you're doing that, Matt, uh, we had a couple of good questions that come in um, with regard to streaming. I, I know that Sonos can do it. Forgive my my ignorance. I, I don't know if Heos can. Uh, in Spotify and Pandora in particular, there's the ability for us to be able to send the stream from the Pandora or Spotify application directly to your to the Heos competitor um, without having to actually open up the Heos or in this case, the Sonos application. Does yeah, Heos allow us to be able to do the same thing? No, we can't do that. And unfortunately what happened there was Sonos got grandfathered in because they were, Sonos was the first one to the market by, by a long stretch. And they were, Spotify allows Sonos to, to control Spotify's app from within the Sonos app, but they don't allow other, other vendors to do that. So when you're listening to Spotify and Heos, it will, it will kind of toggle back and forth between the Heos app and the Spotify app. Um, and once you get used to it, it's really no big deal, but it's not quite as seamless as Sonos just because Heos arrived a little bit later. And by that time, uh, Spotify had changed their policy. So that's, that's the reason why. So I'm gonna move on here because time, the clock's ticking. Um, AirPlay 2 is included on all of our models that have networking, which is almost all of them. The difference between AirPlay 2 and Gen 1 the first generation of AirPlay was point to point, just like Bluetooth. It only allowed you to send music from one Apple device to another. AirPlay 2 is much more similar to Heos or Sonos or others. It uses Wi-Fi, allows you to um, share music on as many AirPlay 2 devices as you have in the home, listen to different music in each zone, the same music, however you'd like to do it. So that is included on all of our, on all of our current products. We're also uh, agnostic when it comes to voice assist technologies. Den and Marantz work with Alexa, Google, and Apple uh, on their voice recognition platforms. There are currently some minor differences in the implementation. I think that eventually all of these functions will be available by all three of the voice assistant platforms for the moment. There are some limitations. Um, I recommend that you guys come back to this webinar once AVE posts it on their YouTube channel. You can come back to this webinar and refer to this chart um, whenever you need any specific information about that. Another feature that we're offering that's quite useful, a lot of people don't like using the remote controls that come in the box because they're full of buttons and they can be a little bit daunting, a little bit confusing sometimes for the consumer. Some people prefer to, to control their, 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 their AVR uh, using a simple web browser, and that's really easy to do. Uh, to make it work, the AVR and the browser have to be on the same network, obviously. Uh, go into the network control section on the AVR menu and just activate network control and it will give you the AVR's uh, IP address which you then plug into your browser and it will bring up all of the same menu functions that you can access via the, the remote control, but in perhaps a more intuitive way because it's all, it's folder based uh, or hierarchy based and it's, it's web based. Now, uh, if you restart your router and you don't have a fixed IP for your AVR, you might have to go in and get the, the updated IP address and, and plug that into your browser each time that you reboot your router. Here's an example of the models that include this browser interface. This is a great uh, illustration of why Denon and Marantz, as well as Yamaha and Onkyo and the rest, why we all have to update our receivers every year. Every year it gets uh, less expensive to implement technology at lower price points. So 
Something we could only offer on our highest end products three years ago is now included on, on almost all of our products. Here's another feature a lot of people are not aware of, the quick select buttons that are found on Denon receivers. On Marantz, it's called Smart Select. It's the same thing, four buttons on the front panel of the receiver. And this is basically a, a type of light automation for uh, memorizing macros. So for example, if you're watching TV and you're in the surround format that you prefer, you, 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 have, you have it set at the volume you prefer to listen at, press and hold this, this cable sat button and it will remember all of those settings. Then next time you come to your receiver, you just press that button. It'll turn on the receiver, it'll select the right source, it'll set the volume to where you last wanted it in the surround format that you prefer. So it's a type of, it's a type of macro that's super easy to use. Here are some of the features, the settings that you can set using the quick select buttons. And if you're using a third party, party automation platform, it saves you a lot of steps. Because instead of having to program uh, receiver on, uh, input HDMI to, uh, surround format, DTS, uh, you know, blah, 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 all you do with your, with your automation programming is, is program that quick select button. So it makes things a lot easier. Uh, those buttons are also found on our good old fashioned remote controls. For those uh, who are using universal remote control, uh, it's very easy with the PIR1, given that it's a specific IR command, it's going to be a unique IR command. For those quick select, it's really easy for you to be able to program those in. So that's really great advice. I actually didn't wasn't aware of that, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, anything to save you another step and make your job easier, right? Uh, let's talk a little bit about EARC. There's quite a bit of confusion about this because audio return channel, ARC, has actually been around for a while. Audio return channel allows uh, the HDMI cable to send a signal, um, you could call it in reverse, from the TV to the AVR. Normally we think of the HDMI connection being from the AVR to the, to the TV, um, sending your source information, the audio and the video to the TV. But what ARC does is it, it allows you to send information backwards from the TV back to the AVR. Standard ARC included the ability to send uh, a digital signal that was equivalent to what you would be, could send through an optical cable. What EARC adds, the enhanced audio return channel, is greater bandwidth. So now, via e, uh, EARC, you can send uncompressed five and seven channel audio, including the high res formats from DTS and Dolby and the 3D audio formats as well. You can send them th those, th that information from the TV to the receiver. So why is this important? It enables a TV centric home theater system. Now this is potentially like a, a huge change in the way that we think about home theaters. Up until now, the receiver has always been thought of as the, so the center of the home theater system. In other words, you connect all of your sources to the receiver, and then the receiver sends the source you're listening to and the, and the video uh, to, to, sorry, sends the video of the source you're listening to to the screen. Uh, but actually, most smart TVs today have much better graphic user interfaces than any receiver does. Consumers are very comfortable using the GUIs on their, on their TVs. And in fact, now most people are streaming directly to their TVs. Most of the major streaming services are now bundled and built in to smart TVs. So you no longer need to use the receiver as you're switching. Uh, device. Connect all of the sources in the system directly to the TV, the, ca the, the cable or, or satellite box, PlayStation or Xbox, a Blu-ray player, whatever it is. Connect all those directly to the TV, then take the HDMI EARC connection from the TV to the receiver, and the receiver will simply take the audio from the TV and reproduce it. In that case, the receiver is responsible for decoding the audio and sending it to all of your speakers, but it's no longer responsible for the switching. It's kind of a different way of thinking about your, the way you wire and cable systems, but I think it's a little more consumer friendly. So with the exception, of, with the exception of eliminating just one of the HDMI cables, or um, I mean, is there any other advantage that you can think of by plugging those devices straight into the television first? I know that maybe there's an uh, edit yeah. handshake or one other point of failure. I mean, any other thoughts? Well, basically, just what I mentioned, Nick, that that it, it's the user interface of the TV is usually more familiar to the end user. So uh, end users hate having to, to do, a lot of times they hate having to use the complicated remote of a home theater receiver to select all of their sources and they, you know, it's, it's, it's can be a little bit com complex. Um, the user interfaces on TVs are light years ahead. So I think that's the main, the main benefit to it. You don't have to use ER, ER, EARC, it's just there as a convenience. You could connect all the sources through the AVR like we've always done, the sound will be exactly the same but then you're using the AVR for all the switching. So here's the list of the models it's available on. Again, another example, look what we can, what we can offer this year 
in our in our receivers at the same price last year we couldn't afford to include this technology so that's another another example of why every year we're updating our, our our products to include the latest technology at similar price points so hdmi 2.1 is another another issue right now causing a lot of confusion a lot of consumers are saying no i don't want to upgrade my receiver yet i want to wait for hdmi 2.1 well here's the news that you need to know hdmi 2.1 really has very little to do with audio it's a, it's a great leap ahead for video but the audio included in HDI, HDMI 2.1 uh, content is the audio we already have. It's Dolby True HD and DTS HD. It's the 3D audio. Um, it, it, the, the HDMI 2.1 platform also includes EARC, but we've already been implementing EARC as of last year. Um, so that's the reason why this year, in fact, we're not going to update all the Denon and, uh, and Marantz AVR models. We're waiting for HDMI 2.1 to be launched in the third or fourth quarter of the year. And at that point, we're gonna upgrade only our mid to high range uh, receivers in both brands. All of our lower cost models will remain the same until next year, because there's really no advantage to, to, to investing the money to upgrade these entry level products with HDMI 2.1, when in fact, as I'm gonna show you, it's irrelevant. So 2.1 has a lot greater bandwidth than 2.0, as you can see, and that will, that will make it compatible with future HK content. Now here's the facts about HK, uh, sorry, HK, oh, 8K, sorry about that. 8, 8K, at the moment, there's still no physical media. There, there's, no, there are no, there's no content available yet in, in 8K. Uh, no streaming devices are yet handling it, but they will in the future. And when 8K content does become available, it's gonna be delivered by streaming services. And the streaming services are gonna be embedded in the customer's smart TV. In other words, that 8K content, the video content will never even touch the AVR. It's going to be streamed directly to the screen, to the monitor. We already have the best quality audio for, 8, for 8K audio. We're already supporting those formats. We're already supporting EARC. So well, all you need to know here really is 8K video is irrelevant for an AVR. Any current AVR from Marantz or Denon is totally ready for 8K video because it has nothing to do with the video. The video is not going to touch the AVR. All right. A couple other features here that might be interesting for, for some of your projects. Um, the current range of receivers allows you to take uh, an HDMI input, a, a, a 5.1 or 7.1 source coming either from streaming or from a Blu-ray disc, and allows you to listen to that soundtrack in its native zone, which is the home theater zone. It could be Atmos or, or HD, okay? It also simultaneously can create a stereo down mix, just analog stereo down mix, so you can send a stereo down mix of that same content to a second zone, or you can send it to another HEOS zone anywhere else in the house uh, because it's been down mixed stereo and it can be shared in, uh, in the HEOS uh, platform. Something new in this generation of receivers uh, is Bluetooth simulcast. Now, this is really interesting. For example, uh, in Latin America and Caribbean, sometimes it happens that families have their grandparents living with them. And sometimes the grandparents are a little hard of hearing. And so they're always asking everyone to turn the volume up, which can be a little bit annoying. Well, now what you can do with the Denon and Marantz receivers is, is that that person can listen on Bluetooth headphones with their own independent volume control while everybody else listens on the home theater system. So in the main, in the general setup menu under Bluetooth headphones, that's the setup. Um, basically the parameters you need to worry about here are you can connect the device. You can only connect one device at once, of course, because that's Bluetooth. It's a point to point uh, connection. You can turn the transmitter on or off. You can you can have the soundtrack for what you're listening to go only out to the Bluetooth Bluetooth headphones or to both the Bluetooth headphones and the speakers. Note that the volume control for the Bluetooth feed is on the headphone itself and not on the AVR. Here's another great integration feature. This is used a lot for light commercial installations, for example, sports bars or sometimes restaurants. You can take the video input from one of your sources, for example, a set top a cable or a satellite TV box. Let's say you want to show the game in any game, could be, could be cricket, could be football, could be baseball, could be whatever. And let's say you want to listen to music coming from another source. You can do that. There are ways to go into the, the input assign menu and select what your source for video is and what your source for audio is. Here's another feature that's technically part of HDMI 2.1, that, but that we started implementing it uh, more than two years ago in some of our products. Auto low latency mode is strictly for video gaming. Um, for gamers, 
it's super important that the audio and the video are 100% synchronized. If there's any microsecond delay at all for audio, it kind of throws off the experience. So ALLM is a signal that is built into video game sources. So when the video game console is connected via HDMI to the receiver, the HDMI automatically detects the signal and automatically enters into low latency mode, uh, which is basically guaranteeing complete synchronization of audio and video for the game. <coughs> Here's a convenient feature. Any input source that's connected via HDMI to the AVR, um, assuming that you have CEC control turned on on both devices, which it usually is by default, the receiver will automatically rename the source based on what you connected to it. So if you connect a PlayStation 4 to the cable input, the receiver will automatically rename it PS4. So you don't have to go in and do that. HDMI diagnostics. This is actually quite technical, and our tech support manager, Raul Salas, is preparing a future webinar just about this. Because actually, it's, it's quite over my head. I don't really know the full details about it. But what it allows you to do is use that AVR as an HDMI diagnostics tool. So let's say you have problems in the home theater system, like there's no picture on the TV, there's no audio coming out of the speakers, or you've got distortion with the video or the audio. HDMI diagnostics helps you to figure out where the problem is. It'll tell you if there's a hardware problem with the AVR, if there's a problem with some of the external uh, components that are connected, if there's a faulty HDMI cable. And it works by connecting an HDMI cable from the HDMI 1 connector in a loop to the monitor 1 connector. And then there's some, some on-screen display tricks you need to do. Stay tuned. Uh, within the next month or two, we hope to launch a webinar about this, and, and AVE will certainly let you know about it when it's available. Okay, so that's sort of it for the summary of relevant home theater features today. I'm going to run really quick through the product lines. I'm not going to go uh, feature, I'm not going to go model by model because I don't, uh, it, I'll explain why. It's, it's kind of a waste of time to do it that way. We have step charts. This is a step chart. Uh, we have these for all of the Dan and Amaranth receivers, and you can see why it's called a step chart. And here's the way you read a step chart. This model right here, our entry level receiver, has everything you see from this line below. Everything you see in this rectangle are features that this receiver has, as well as these other receivers. But from this line to this line, these are this is what you get if you upgrade to an S650. You get these features. If you upgrade from an S650 to an S750, you get these features. So I think you get the idea. Denon has two series of AVRs, the S series and the X series. The S series is primarily thought is primarily designed for retail environments. Uh, usually doesn't have quite as many integration features and tends to have lower price points. The top of the line of the S series, the 950, is very similar to the entry level X series, which is the 1600. The X series is really where the line gets pretty interesting with a lot of integration specific features, and that's where the line gets quite high end is in the X series. So here you can see step charts for the four S series models, and here's the X series, the first half of the X series lineup, and the second half of the X series lineup culminating with the beast the x8500 which is our largest and most expensive receiver it's the it's the world's only 13 channel receiver this thing is a monster it's got 13 channels with 150 watts per channel every single kind of circuit and decoding that you could ever want it's built in japan at our shirokawa works factory where we manufacture our most uh, our, our, our most expensive and finest quality denon and Marantz products here you can see a picture of, of the way the, the construction of this piece the 8500 is so heavy that just the power transformer weighs the same as an AVR X1600. How's that for cool? Skipping over, uh, oh, one more product I wanted to mention. Yeah, this is a pretty new one. Denon is finally back in the stereo receiver business. We've realized that there's a lot of consumers that want, uh, they want stereo next to their TV. They don't want a five channel home theater system, but they do want to be able to connect HDMI sources in and out and they want it to have Wi-Fi, and they want it to have Bluetooth, et cetera. So the Denon DRA800H is basically like a home theater receiver, but it's only two channels. It's a great solution for those, those kinds of systems. Now, Marantz also has two different lines of receivers. That's the NR series and the SR series. NR series consists of two models, and it's pretty cool because it's 60% the height of a full-size AVR, so it's much more uh, acceptable in terms of decor uh, and the... Uh, famous spouse uh, acceptance factor. So this is a low profile chassis. Uh, the NR series consists of just these two models. Um, they're both 50 watt platforms. There's a five channel model and a seven channel model. 
Then we jumped to the SR series, which is sort of the, the meat, the meat and potatoes of the Marantz line. Here are the first two models, here are the second two models. And one thing that separates Marantz from Denon is the Marantz has separates. We have preamp processors and outboard uh, power amplifiers on the Marantz lineup, something that Denon does not have. Here's a picture of the back panel of the two pre-pros, the pre preamp processors from Marantz. Our flagship, the 8805, actually shares a lot of the same components with that uh, top of the line Denon receiver. It's also made in Japan at the Shirakawa, Shirakawa Works factory. Here's an, uh, here are the three power amps. We have a stereo amp, a five channel amp, and a seven channel amp. So these are great to sell along with preamp processors. This is for those, cons those consumers that are really looking to do a, a high end home theater system. The advantage of this too is that in the future, if Marantz, uh, well, when Marantz offers new preamp processors with new features and new technology down the road, the customer can keep the same power amp and just upgrade uh, the, the front end, upgrade the, the preamp processor. So just like Denon, uh, Marantz also just launched a stereo receiver. It's called the NR1200. Same concept. It's got a lot of the same features that a home theater receiver has. It's, in, it's built in the NR uh, chassis platform, uh, but it's just a stereo amp, 75 watts times two. And here's another one I want to mention, another new product from Marantz, the ND8006. This is kind of a jack of all trades source unit for audiophiles. It's got a CD player, it's got HEOS built in, it's got a very high quality digital analog converter. It has AirPlay uh, from Apple, it has Bluetooth, it has Wi-Fi. Uh, it's a really interesting product, also made in Shirakawa Works in Japan, extremely high quality unit. You can see from the back panel, uh, the large array of connections that are available with this unit. So with that, I am going to wrap up the webinar. I really appreciate everybody's attention and taking the time to join us for the webinar today. Um, unfortunately, I've got a hard stop here. I need to jump off uh, in just a couple minutes, but I, I've got time to take uh, maybe a question or two from you, Nick, if, if you've got any good questions to, to bring up. Yeah, yeah. So just to, I, I've got two interesting ones. Um, is there any settings that you have to adjust in order to be able to get audio return channel or enhanced audio return channel to work, or does it just work plug and play, assuming that you've it's got a cable to support play it? Most it, it, most companies, most brands are making it, uh, or have it on by default. But just to be sure, whenever you're doing the installation, check on the monitors menu, check on the AVRs menu, just to make sure that it is turned on. But I believe that out of the box, it is turned on by default. And and I think that we got to make sure that the HDMI cable itself will support that. So all of the ones from Audio Video Export, whether you're looking for something uh, uh, cheap and cheerful, but high quality being the structure cable products, HDMI cables, or you're looking for really high-end uh, straight wire cables um, that that aren't, you know, when I say high-end, don't get freaked out by a, a ginormous price tag. No, these are these are solid, you know, proven proven cables yeah. that are guaranteed you to work in our settings. If you're using a five or six-year-old HDMI cable, it probably won't have the bandwidth. It probably isn't certified for for high speed. So um, I always say, if, at the moment that you're specking out a new home theater system, include a new router and include updated HDMI cables. Absolutely. HDMI do, do, uh, over time, they can fail. They're pretty delicate. And routers every year get better and better for the same price. So if, you, if you're installing a brand new home theater and the customer is, you know, is using a four-year-old router, it's sort of like putting crappy tires on a brand new car. It doesn't yep. really make sense. So, so include a Luxol router sold by AVE. Those are great routers. Uh, include a new router whenever you're specking in a new system. Thank you, man. And then uh, finally, just before you get going, I don't want to hold you up anymore. Um, do you know anything about multi-zones and AVRs and, and as it relates to HEOS? I mean, is there anything in particular um, that you have to do in order to be able to get, like for a multi-channel AVR, does the HEOS app allow zone one and zone two or, yes, or not? Yes, exactly. Within the HEOS app, you can select which zones of the receiver you want to reproduce the HEOS signal. It could be any zone or all zones. Within the HEOS app, you can do that. And uh, again, I believe that's all set up by default, straight out of the box. Um, on, on the AVR, HEOS is, is a source. And so uh, because, because the HEOS uh, circuit is integrated into the receiver, it allows you to control certain aspects of this, the receiver's function through the, the HEOS app. Perfect. Yeah. All um, right, guys, listen, I got to go. I, I really want to thank everybody for their time today. I hope this uh, webinar has been useful for you. Look forward to seeing you guys in the future at a future AVE training event. Uh, any further questions you have, uh, you know, Nick and Jorge at AVE, both Jorge's, they're always there at your service. And uh, if you have any questions that they can't answer, uh, you know, we will always work with them in the factory to make sure we can get you guys the right answers and all the support that you need. 
So again, thanks, thanks guys. I'm going to bow out, and uh, you can stay on and continue uh, your question and answer session with Nick at ABE. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks Bye -bye. so much, Matt. Uh